it's a real pleasure to welcome Amy King, who is the founder and chief exec of People Matter and is leading a fascinating piece of work around positive mental wellness in the workplace. So I'm going to hand straight over to Amy and thank you. Thank you so much and uh, yeah welcome everyone thank you for making the time out of your busy day to be here and great to hear so many of you already been in sessions which is fantastic um by means of very quick introduction um uh, as kind of said already i'm one of the co-founders uh, with nigel winship of people matter and we'll talk a little bit more about what we do in this session um but in in short we really specialize in building intelligent mental wellness tools which are really focused around taking a very data-led approach to how you can not only measure mental well-being but also in a way that you can be really proactive and preventative to help improve and prevent poor mental health as a whole and uh, this this session today is is a big big topic we, we could spend a whole day on it probably so I've, I've just put together really just uh, what some of the core challenges are in this space. It's becoming increasingly important. And as you think about your workplace at the moment, if you're thinking about how to tackle some of the modern day challenges of COVID-19, just the complete diversity in terms of how work gets done, um, mental health in general at the moment, in terms of the digital world and how that impacts us. There, there are a huge amount of questions being raised around what is the right approach to take from a workplace perspective, but also what are some of the ethical considerations or the kind of privacy and digital considerations in getting that right. Um, so, so we've been on this journey uh, since 2018 and we, we're hugely passionate about what we do. I'm a business psychologist by background and what inspired me to, to get into this in the first place was uh, I'd, I'd worked with lots of large organisations around the world, much more focused on talent and assessment, culture, high performing teams. But two things happened, really. The first was I, through my own career, actually completely burnt out. It, complete, it completely took me by surprise, uh, not only because it happened very gradually, but also, ironically, I actually did my MSc on burnout in, in terms of my dissertation and how to prevent it. So. That, that was one story in its own right, which kind of opened my eyes to it um, through my own experiences. But then also, you know, just, just in recognising the world around us, it, I, I could see so many people were really up against just the challenges of this always on fast paced modern day life that we find ourselves in today. Um, and technology and data and everything we're talking about has a huge contribution to that. So, um, so that's that's kind of a little bit of background, and I think I've kind of kicked off into the problem that we see in this world already, which is, you know, if you rewind back 100 years, 200 years, innovation and the pace of the way in which things got done was a lot slower and a lot more predictable, and you had time to adjust to new things coming your way, whether it was a business perspective or from a personal perspective, it, it was a lot easier to see and adjust um, to, to things that were happening. Whereas today, we're in, it's just so uh, fast paced and dis disruptive. Um, and it not only causes us strain in our workplaces that are now going under considerable change, transformation. I mean, it's very difficult to predict much, um, you know, at the moment. Um, you can have any competitor at any point come up or you can look at it from a COVID perspective. Um, so there's a lot that we face in our work, but then we also face in our personal life with this always on nature of work. And, you know, in terms of the rate, rate of innovation, it, it's, it's not a new thing. Um, this is a very famous picture um, of a particular street in New York uh, back in 1905. And for since forever, humans have been finding new ways to solve problems and to improve our way of living and our way of working. And, you know, within 10 years of this picture being taken, which was all horse and carts, the same street looked completely different as the automobile, you know, came to life and became available to the consumer market. So that was within 10 years and that was 100 years ago, which was a huge transformation. But you look at today and, you know, the simple statement here is just recognising that it, it's not just the amount of innovation we're experiencing, it's the velocity, it's the speed 
at which things are happening within a given year um, and a given month and at the moment you could argue within a given week so it used to be 150 years 10 years that we had these changes now it is so much happening so quickly that we are we're really feeling it and what's fascinating in that is we're in this new era at the moment where the, the innovations that we're finding ourselves with you know kind of building at the moment and using is is incredibly smart and you know with the development of ai and uh, ultimately with new ways in which technology can understand and perceive the world and you it creates so much data masses and masses of data that we just never had before so it's incredibly exciting um, it's also incredibly challenging and you know the way that we we looked at this back in 2018 was really to ask our questions well that's great but who is it really serving is it is it innovation for innovation's sake is it about money you know is it about really truly improving our lives because it, it can actually become quite questionable and almost we have this paradox where we've got so much opportunity yet you look at the stats around our mental health and our well-being and our rates of burnout and just even the change of that over recent years and it's extremely costly and it's extremely um, prevalent in our lives um, in, in terms of poor mental health where we're not at our best and technology is becoming more and more part of that journey so um, I'm sure some of you are pretty well versed with the recent uh, documentary by Netflix, but it's if you haven't seen it, I really recommend it. It very simply puts a spotlight on the role that social media has basically had on our society, but also it's much more from a creator's perspective, which is these were people who set out with a positive intent with social media on the most part um, to connect people and to create opportunity and there's there's lots of that out there but as monetization became more and more important to um, social media and to grow etc uh, it, it started to distort its original intent and there are some really um, quite stark quotes that, that actually they referenced throughout this documentary, which was highlighting the power of our own data in our own lives is immensely valuable. And, you know, it, it's be become a game really um, and, and big business to be able to look at data and to leverage that data. It's been done for years from a marketing perspective. It's be, been done in recent years from a social media perspective and that there's this kind of awakening of, and consciousness and awareness that is starting to grow to say, well, is this right? And what is what is the impact of this um, to our lives? So here's just a few here. So if you're not paying for the product, you are the product. I think that's a brilliant one because it really causes you to question what, what you're using and, and how your data might be coming into that. It's a marketplace that trades exclusively in human futures. Um, and I'll, I'll come back to that sentiment as we go through this session, but it's it, it does kind of get you really thinking around data on the social scene or just data, you know, whether it's through workplaces, through the products that you're buying that are physical, you know, that there is a huge amount there that could be available and could be used to, for some purpose that perhaps you might not know about or perhaps is questionable in some way. And when we look at you know in recent years in the last you know 20 30 years whilst there has been a lot more awareness a lot less stigma which is fantastic and a lot you know a lot more reporting overall there is a recognition that uh, our mental health has been uh, at least it, the reporting of it has increased um, significantly by 20 percent and when you actually kind of delve into that in more detail uh, what is most concerning, what well, I don't know if I call it most concerning, but where you definitely see a, a real shift is in young people. Um, and it pretty much marries up to when, you know, social media really came about. So this isn't meant to just all, all be do, doom and gloom, I promise, but it's really important when we start thinking about mental health at the workplace. Um, so by means of just bringing to life 
the ethical concerns that have now grown from social media use. And it's not just the use of social media, it, it's really looking at how these systems are have been built you. So your data provides an insight on your life and the way you're living, the way you're working, what you like, what you don't like. And these systems are then actively working to hook you back in. So it's an attention economy to try and grab you and bring you back into this environment so that then it, there's attention and therefore it, you can be monetized within the system. And so this addictive nature that has, has started to grow has now been associated with poor mental health. Um, there's many, many studies that link it to a rise in depression, anxiety, loneliness, self-harm, and suicidal thoughts. And there's a lot which sits around this due to poor, like lower self-esteem, FOMO, which is fear of missing out. Um, that we are social creatures, so by nature, we're constantly seeking to belong. So the systems are not necessarily interested in that. They're looking for ensuring that you feel motivated to come back in to see what's going on. Uh, despite the fact that they're social uh, in general, you know, high usage tends to be linked with loneliness. And there was a really interesting study which showed that for people who do use social media, actually actively reducing it by just 30 minutes a day, a day did actually um, have a positive impact on mental health. So there was a reduction in some of the challenges that uh, were being faced by people. So there's real data growing around like, and building an awareness around not just these digital tool sets that we've been building for ourselves and, and questioning our mental health, but and the impact on mental health, but also just there's more awareness now around data and, and what that could mean. More data, more AI, you know, all this all this amazing technology that can do so many good things is ultimately asking us to question more and more. What are the ethics? What you know, who can we trust or what can we trust? But also, what does it mean to be human? You know, what, what's this really for and how do we help serve our human condition um, in a way that's positive? And the question we were faced with as, as Nigel and I were really forming People Matter was, can data use, can, can data be used to truly benefit us as human beings? And that was really the starting point, you know, regardless of, you know, our personal story started at the beginning of this. It was how can we flip this on its head so that data isn't just being used to be extracted, to market, to sell, to you know, drive a behaviour in you, to hook you back in. What if data could be insight so that you could be much more uh, proactive around your life and, and be able to navigate this crazy, chaotic world that we find ourselves in? And for us, it, it was kind of really centred around, well, what does this mean from a workplace perspective? We've got so much happening on a day to day basis. You know, we have email overload, but we've got so many new systems now. Uh, some of you might use Slack. We've got Zoom and Microsoft Teams. We're working remotely more and more. And, you know, all of these notifications, they all still play into this kind of idea that, you know, our digital um, hooks our digital demands could be impacting our mental well-being. So it's not just social; it's it's infiltrated into the way that we're work, living and working much more broadly. And you know, I think it, I'd be really interested to hear. I don't know if any of you would be happy to share in the comments. Just you know, what you're noticing in your workplace. You know, particularly this year from a COVID-19 perspective, but it, it could be more broadly. What are you seeing being your challenges at the moment around mental well-being at work, but also really specifically the digital way in which work is happening and the strains that could be causing for people in terms of how things get done. So that there is a grow recognition of the problem. Um, and I think with that, you know, which is really positive, is there is a massive uh, kind of trend growing at the moment around investment to address workplace well-being. So that is from an employee perspective, your employer, your workplace is offering some sort of package or solution. Uh, it could be technical, it could be physical, it could be a benefit of some kind, which is helping people to be you know, more mentally healthy, more mentally well. 
and this this whole area I could, you know we could talk about this marketplace for a while but it's come from reactive mental health um, solutions which is much more about EAP which is employee assistance programs and kind of giving support when it's needed where the market's moving to now is proactive mental well-being solutions which is helping people to prevent poor mental health, prevent burnout, prevent stress and strain and, and therefore things like absence, which is benefit for you as an individual, right? But it's also benefit for the organisation. But again, still with any technical solution, it still poses the question, how can how how much can we really trust the technology? And again, how is data really being used? If you're an employee, you know, can I trust my employer with any data that might be shared? What does that look like overall? So there's some big questions that are just starting to be to be they're starting to be talked about at the moment, but it's still very early on in this space. I think um, organisations are just trying to make sense of what's what and how to map out a, a well-being strategy, and then ultimately get solutions in place that you know cover as much as possible with little resource available. So, so that's a prelude really to to who we are and and what I just want to bring to life then is how we have started to take some of these core questions, some of these core challenges to to a practical application and to a way in which we've been looking to bring together the latest technology and data science and psychology to to look at this in a way that we think can really add value. So our whole vision is the world <laughs> has been extremely chaotic and it will continue to be most likely so what can we do to create a more caring world what can we what can we create that will empower people to take more charge in their lives but also more than that how do we empower organizations so that you have more insights and more opportunity to like i said be preventative and to create the environments and the conditions for people to thrive and there is so much that's psychology that really highlights that when our social environments and our kind of physical environments are positive and sustainable and healthy, we are far more likely to be healthy mentally ourselves as well. Apologies, I've got my slack on. I'm going to actually, I'm just going to turn this off quickly. One second, otherwise you're all going to be bombarded. OK, one second. OK. Thanks, guys. All right. Um, so, so yes. Yeah, so, so, there's a huge amount of psychological research which highlights that when we are surrounded by, by the right environments, we will thrive. And you know, our motivations inherently within our kind of neurochemistry mean that we respond well to positive social environments. It's not just down to our own actions in isolation. It's it's all within context. So we have been on a very exciting journey over the last 18 months, really specifically, to build out what we call intelligent mental wellness tools. And we, by that, we really mean we are aiming to take a very data-led approach to help people to understand the risk factors of burnout before it happens, but to also understand more from a positive psychology perspective, which is not just how you get to good, but how you actually get to great and be at your best and build a skill set and a capability set so that you can work your way through all the craziness. And that is both digitally, but also just, you know, within your lifestyle. So the concept for us has been simple. Let's make data useful and meaningful and relevant and good for the human spirit and soul. Let's let's provide data and flip this on its head so that you're in charge and you start to be able to get insight around how your digital lifestyle and your digital world and your overall way of living could be impacting your mental mental health. And we'll, I'll talk more about that in just a minute. But the second part is why does well-being have to be so clunky? There's there's so much good content out there, and it can be pretty overwhelming sometimes to be able to make sense of what solutions and what advice is most relevant to you right now and if you think about when you're looking for a song to play and we were talking about that start you don't sift through an alphabetically ordered spotify to find the perfect song 
it's grouped by you know categories genres but then also it learns about your preferences so where are you at and what might be interesting to you and well-being can be exactly the same if you are a very busy burnt out single parent versus a graduate who's just left university and trying to get a first job but or, or started a new job and is, is struggling in a different way different advice will be appropriate and in and different forums and mediums and then finally which is the center of this is how do we also do this in a way that's ethical how do we ensure that privacy is protected and trust is built for the user because even with the most intelligent savvy amazing product it's only as good as people really trust it and there and and want to use it um, and our theory on this has been really built from very much a psychological basis first. While technology provides a huge way to you know, do more, the basis of what we do at People Matter is centred around psychology and what brings out the best in us. And when you look at the workplace, you know, I could talk about this for ages and I, I won't today because it's not the core focus, but that there's a huge amount where we can start to look at clues and signs within someone's job role, within someone's workplace culture, which provide insight on how healthy that culture is, but then also it can provide insight in terms of a risk score. So there are a number of known factors that contribute to poor mental health. These are known as, these aren't all of them, some of them, um, but they're called psychosocial factors. And in fact, there is a new ISO standard that is currently being worked on. It's not been released yet. It's, it's due to be released next year, which is about providing guidance to employers. Um, and, and ultimately, it's, it's obviously then something you can sign up for and complete to ensure that your culture is sustainable and healthy from a psychosocial perspective. So less about health and safety physically and more around um, you know how people are relating to their environment so things like lack of control where people don't feel they have the ability to you know take autonomy and, and make a change is is massively associated with mental health social support is key and, and that links to isolation and loneliness as well work-life imbalance again has a big impact to burnout unclear job expectation dis Dis and expectations, dysfunctional workplace dynamics. So this is things like conflict. Um, it, it can be things as extreme as bullying. It could be micromanagement. It's really the social kind of pain that you might get from re poor relationships um, or you know uh, dynamics at work. And then any extremes of acti activity. So workload, high job demands, complexity. A constant volatile change it all just drains your resources over time and, and over time this is where it can deplete you as an individual if you are under extreme stress and pressure every single day you start to deplete in your energy and as your energy depletes you move into a survival mentality which is again it's a stress response it's, it's a very adaptive positive response in most cases but when it's excessive, which is every single day, it can start to lead to burnout where you get to a state of chronic exhaustion. You become more detached and that there are some very prominent signals that would suggest that someone is burnt out um, psychologically, but also in behaviour. And that leads to a drop in productivity and performance. And this cycle goes round and round and it gets worse and worse and it's often hidden to the organisation and it's often when it's too late that you realise as an individual and it takes considerable time to overcome that um, negative impact basically. It's, um, it, it's a lasting effect because it's a physiological change in your body that's happened through um, an, an over fatigued central no nervous system where it's no longer responding to stress in a way that is effective anymore. So it's it's burnt out literally is, is the word that gets used because you're not perceiving stress in a way that is adaptive anymore. And it does link to absolute absenteeism, job turnover performance, but also most, you know, most importantly, it actually has lasting impact to um, your own mental health. And there's, there's some loads of studies on this, but one particular one that really stands out is, you know, when we overwork to the point where we burn out, 
it actually can trigger off more mental health problems, despite the fact you might have never had any poor mental health in the past. So it is the more extreme end of, of what can happen in terms of poor culture and kind of how your workplace can impact you on a day to day basis. It can also link to stuff outside of work as well. But the, the key thing for me and, and for us and when we look at this is with the right insights, awareness and action, burnout can be prevented. Um, it's a very private matter, so it's not something that everyone will speak up about, which is why being able to drive data and insights can be so powerful because you get to decide and take more control on your mental health. So that was that was our observation and, and we, we kind of got to the point where we said if we can start to flip this so that your digital data, um, if you want it to, could be used to provide you insight on are you at risk of burning out or have you got a really healthy, supportive environment, all these kind of environmental factors, that's much more interesting than just only looking at your state, which is more how you feel. So. Um, by means of bringing to life what we're doing then um, more tangibly, we ultimately develop um, a set of tools. It's a platform called Akina, which helps you as an individual to get to know your digital self. So it, it, it can be any type of data that could exist around, about you already. Should you wish to connect to him, you don't have to. Again, that's completely up to you. But if you think about how you're working right now, you will be leaving this like breadcrumb trail of when, how, where you're living and working and that whilst one piece of data is not interesting, metadata, which is data about data, is fascinating because it actually starts to say, well, what's your normal and what's your kind of routine that works well versus where could things be tipping to be out of balance? If you're working 12 hours a day every day for a month, you know, that would tell a story and provide some insights as to what that might mean for your mental well-being. So we, we've been working to find a way to test this idea um, with a set number of hypotheses. Uh, we ran a 12 month R&D project with an enterprise customer to say that, you know, can metadata, data about data, tell us something meaningful about someone's mental well-being? And that's with the view that through our product set, that individual can, in a private, secure way, and the way you know, they can be completely invisible to anyone else, understand that and take action that that was our core focus but as we've been on this journey it's right it has highlighted so many not just questions technically around well how does this work and what do you do but it's it's been a massive journey to really be clear on what feels right ethically and where do we really get clear and quite strict for us in what we're building and and, and how can tech really be good because when you look back at the social media creators, there was no mal intent necessarily. They weren't trying to, you know, reduce people's mental health. It's just it was a unexpected consequence. And there's this growing um, development in the digital world at the moment, which is a consciousness. Um, you know, there's digital sociologists now who are literally looking at the mass scale of impact of digital data and innovation um, and what are the unintended consequences of innovation. Um, so it, it's, it's a very fruitful space and I, I think there might be another session on some of that um, in within this week. So um, some of the questions we've been thinking about um, and we have in the team some brilliant people who do deep thinking on this on, an, on a daily basis. This isn't stuff that you know, Nigel and I just kind of pop, pop, pop on a piece of paper and say, well, that's what we think. You know, our data scientists and our advisors, we've we've kind of built around the business to ensure that we are as, as close to what we intend to be as possible. And the first question when you're thinking of any digital wellbeing tool is privacy. And privacy by means of definition is really our own right to control the access that other people have to our personal world. And that can be physically or psychologically. 
and it can be attained by basically creating barriers or communicating them verbally. So the way you can start to break down that um, more clearly is first is barriers. So is there a way for any given digital product for someone to create those barriers? What do they actually look like? Um, in the world of the digital landscape, often digital barriers are given by consent. So the big thing about consent is you have to therefore provide more control to the user, which is maximising the options available for people to actually be able to control their barriers. If you don't give people that, that option in the first place, then the privacy that you're able to give people, or at least the options around the level of privacy versus the value you might get from sharing data in some way, is going to be limited. So they're the three things that we think about. So for us, we've very been very, very clear from the get go that we need to give people the right to create barriers. But also, it's not just a barrier, it's a layering of those barriers to say, well, you know, this barrier here, I'm going to put up because of whatever reason, where this barrier here, I'm happier to provide my data because I see the greater good um, for whatever reason. So an example of that. Sorry, go on. Uh, Some... Amy, uh, I was just going to say, so um, I'm just conscious of time and Ashley's asked a question. And so I just wondered, it's really difficult to know when to interrupt and it's really fascinating stuff. But Ashley's asked, have you driven ethics of machine learning and artificial intelligence into the data gathering and results aspect of what you're doing? And Ashley might want to, to, to come in, very welcome to. Yes, so, so just let me replay that back. Have we built in ethics into our data science? Is that correct? Uh, yeah, have you taken the, the aspect of ethics into the machine learning and artificial intelligence aspects, both into the data gathering aspects, but also into the results aspects that will come out? Yeah, no, great question. So um, I think the first part is consent um, always. So the, the ethical kind of position is to be completely transparent up front, which I think links to this point here, which is up front to anyone who is participating or, or working with us is we're really clear up front around what data is collected and why and giving people that right to privacy. I think to your question around the results and the insights, I, I haven't included it in this pack, but there's lots of areas of AI that you have to be really clear on when you're doing this sort of work, because there's a level that is much more focused around perception. So how is technology perceiving something about you? There's judgment, which is, so what does that mean? Which is an action or a recommendation. And then the third is where you're then starting to get into the realm of predictive analytics, which poses all sorts of questions. And to, to kind of put it very simply, we have what we haven't done, and we, we decided to do this very early on, is we're not doing uh, like randomised machine, automated machine learning, where you just throw lots of data in and you try and find some, something interesting. Everything that we've done has actually been based on a psychological model, um, which is starting with science first to say, you know, what are the different environmental psychological factors that could be a risk factor or important to boosting someone's mental health? And then ultimately every piece of data that we collect first gets mapped across and, you know, processed through this psychosocial model. And then we test ultimately through the model that we've been refining and testing it in a very procedural way so that we're really clear on what's what, what we're developing and for what outcome and why. Um, and that you can look at that from a number of angles, basically. Does that help? It, it does. Um, I, I only bring it up because one of my protégés runs an ethical uh, artificial intelligence organisation. And so uh, I, I, I have an interest in seeing that this is uh, being thought of and that bias is being um, driven out, which is a hard one to, to, to get out biased by nature. Yes, it is. Yeah, it's yeah. The bias is a whole whole uh, topic in its own right. Um, and there are lots of horror stories of where scientifically there's not been uh, 
it's, it's not been rigorous enough to look for bias and in how the model's been built. Um, it, at the same time, what, what you can do with data as well is it makes it more easy to identify uh, and, and to be able to adjust for where there could be, you know, more natural human flaws as well. Um, so it can also highlight where there's problems that you might not have already seen. Um, that's a, um, a whole other presentation that I could definitely give at some point. But uh, you're absolutely right. There's there's a huge amount of danger in these in these um, models if not done properly. Uh, thank thank you, and I, I won't take you on any further on this tangent. <laughs> Well, it's, it's hugely relevant to the whole topic. So thank you, Ashley, for um, for sharing that and, and for giving your thoughts. So, yeah, I mean, just just by means of um, kind of wrapping up then our, our approach, uh, you know, we those standards that we define are are really important. It's uh, and just to kind of give you a feel for how the product is building and, and how this is starting to apply itself. And um, Akina is one uh, user interface that's uh, been developed, which is for the individual. And you can, as a user, sign up. You've all been invited to this, by the way. Um, and don't feel obliged to sign up unless you want to. It, it won't plug into your digital data at this point. It's it will purely be just for you to have a get a feel for what sits within it. Um, and you can do things like self-report. Uh, so it gives you a view of one of the early versions of the app. But ultimately, you can choose your consent levels. You can choose to remain completely private and invisible. Only you would ever see your data. And it's a companion for people in how they measure and track how they're feeling. And I apologise, this next slide is not particularly pretty. Um, this is <laughs> come from our data science side, but you know, we, we've invested just by means of bringing to life how you can take a concept and a principle to practice. If you were to look at a companion or a real friendship, there are models which look at how you can judge whether that is a truly close friend that you trust or someone who is more of an acquaintance or someone you just know. And you know, that, that goes up from level one to six. And so by similar means, we have mapped out from an app perspective what level one, level two, level three could mean from a consent perspective. So this, the idea is really simple. Trust is currency and trust is based on your belief and confidence that what you're being told is true and reliable. So the higher the highest higher the levels of trust the more likely you are to want to be able to sign up for and use a product like this and potentially to you know, integrate your data into it. Obviously, there's a value exchange with that as well. Some people, you know, they just want, I don't know, they to they just want the insights so they don't care. But more and more people are much more conscious now around their data, particularly when you're talking about it from a wellness context. So, so we've been mapping it up um, overall, and um, and that then obviously then allows us to get different insights from different people in different ways. If the user chooses to consent to share their data in any way at all, there's different levels which exist just from an R&D perspective to people matter, which is only ever anonymous, but they can also choose to share their data to their employer, which has been a really interesting um, journey to be on book. As we started this, we didn't know how many people would be comfortable with, and to this point about trust, would share their data. But what we found is by actually being really clear up front with these principles um, around privacy and trust, we've been able to get to about 70% consent rate to share data with the employer. It's only ever anonymous. It's never about individuals. It's about being able to provide an insight to an organisation so that actually culture can be properly addressed and so that more accountability can be given. So we can work with an organisation to say these are where this is your burnout risk level today or this is how healthy your culture is and this is the profile of your business. Again, the framework that I talked about a moment ago. So that's kind of, um, I think it's been about 70% consent rate um, and the data digital self consent rate, because we separate it out, you can use the app and not connect your digital self in, is, is around about 68%. So both are pretty good, they're higher than we expected. 
for a first round and how we've engaged with um, our kind of clients so far. So, um, so I know we're running out of time, but that, that really covers like really how we've been thinking about this landscape, the problems that we face today in modern society, but also kind of there's a growing awareness for and questions around workplace um, analytics. HR analytics is becoming a thing, but actually there's also a shift now in in rather than it being called HR tech, it's it's being much more focused around workplace tech, which is much more about how does it really benefit the employee and is there really truly truly transparency? Um, but just by means of you know some of the questions we've been we still work through every day is and, and as you're thinking about perhaps your own organisation, you know when you're looking at technology and data and ethics, you know it doesn't have to be your silver bullet way. There's never a silver bullet um, answer to these things. But these are things that you can be actively asking yourself. I'm happy to share the slides around for anyone who wants them. Um, you know, is it the, is there a simpler way of doing it without technology is always a good question to ask yourself. If you move this technology across different parts of your business or in other contexts, would it still work? Can it be explained well? And what, if you get an insight like an index or some sort of, you know, output, is it is it really clear how all that's happened or is it some secret black box? And if it feels like a black box, that, that should really be questioned. Um, et cetera, et cetera. So it's good to be sceptical. Ask the right questions of anyone that you might be working with on a technolog technological basis. Um, there are growing standards building, but at the moment, you know, from a kind of legal perspective, it's still, you know, looser than it should be really in terms of what happens. Um, and if you would like to get in touch um, or if you'd like to hang on and ask, ask any questions, please do. Um, but my email address is amy at peoplematter.tech. Uh, if you would like to work more closely with us on our product development and become part of our beta group, uh, our programme to work with us, just send me a note and we will get, get you enrolled to that with our, with our head of product, Tom. But uh, other than that, that's everything. Thank you. If, if you've got any questions. <laughs> <laughs> that's been brilliant Amy I think everybody's saying how thought provoking it is there's lots of noise on Twitter as well so it's been really fantastic and it's great to hear from a supplier that's just really serious about ethics and privacy so um, brilliant stuff and I've learned two things two things I didn't know in terms of a new role digital sociologist not come across that one before so that's interesting and actually that's a, that's a really important fact isn't it just a 30 minute reduction in terms of using social media has a has a positive impact on your mental health so yeah really brilliant for taking time to to talk to us about this thank you did anybody want to stay on have a quick question for Amy and wanted to pop that in the chat bar Jess might be typing I'm just going to give a second just in case yeah got to go that's fine I I have one link for you all to have a watch of you talked about the digital sociologist uh, just a minute ago and um, I had the pleasure of meeting this brilliant person called Lisa who is a so digital sociologist who talks about technology being a system not a product and just all the kind of big picture stuff to think about with technology um but yeah thank you everyone if you've got any questions just email me um I'm here oh well, thank you ever so much and enjoy the rest of the festival everybody if you're coming to any other sessions and amy is talking again um, on Thursday so if you hadn't subscribed to that and you wanted to hear the next stage of the story then there's still chance to do that enjoy the rest of your day thank you